Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's Sunday School class. Glad you're here with us this morning. Reach down and grab a hymnal and turn to page number 375. Page number 375. We'll sing together, Saved by the Blood. Amen. Page 375. Page 377, faith is the victory. Amen. 377. In Faith is a victory. 
we thank you again for the opportunity to be here this morning. We ask now, Lord, that you would meet with us, open our ears, as well as our physical and spiritual hearts and our minds. Lord, I pray that we would learn from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. All right. Good morning. Mrs. H is down in uh, Salt Lake seeing one of our sons and grandkids and uh, be back tonight having a good time down there. You know when you get older uh, versus when you're younger and married, you know, she used to always bring things by me and say, I'm thinking about doing this and I'm thinking about doing that and what do you think? And But when you get older... Uh, she skipped that step, and uh, it's just, uh, oh, by the way, I bought a plane ticket, I'm going to Salt Lake, and we're going to go down and see the grandson for his birthday. Good idea, honey, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? All right. Uh, this morning I got up early, and like I usually do, and I, I take our two dogs for a walk. And I usually do that about quarter to seven. It's still pretty dark out, quarter to seven. And uh, uh, you can almost see the trail. I just walked the pivot track all the way around the field. And on the edge of the field, down on the far side, it's just tall grass and trees and along the canal bank. And, <clears throat> and uh, the only thing that I, I'm afraid of walking into is a skunk. You know, outside of that, I'm not too afraid. Or, and the dogs, unfortunately, aren't afraid either to run into a skunk. Um, so this morning I'm walking down there, and I generally don't walk with a flashlight on. I just try to follow the trail a little bit. And, and I get around to uh, the very far side down there by the canal, and the dogs all of a sudden, and they saw something, and they took off. Now this, this part of the country there is still considered country. It's out there by Marsing along the river, and there's been lots of sightings of mountain lion down there. And so... Uh, so I'm walking around, and uh, I finally get up to the dogs, and I, I could hear there was some growling going on. And the female dog came running back. Whatever it was she ran into, she didn't want to have no part of. Now the male, he's, he's, he's right in. You know, he's staying right there. He's having a good old time, whatever he, he encountered. But I heard some growling up there. And so I clicked the flashlight on, you know, wondering what it was that was going to come darting out of the grass at me. And... And uh, I get up there, and sure enough, it's a mountain lion. They had uh, treed this mountain lion up, up and, uh, you know, I've got the flashlight up on the tree, and I can see it up there. But this is a strange mountain lion. It had a head like a raccoon. <laughs> but in my mind, it was a mountain lion, right? It was life or death situation out there with the dogs. I can see why that other dog came running back. She was afraid, and... Anyway, <laughs> I had the light up there, and that thing was just looking at me, waiting for me to pass, and we moved on. And it's amazing what our brains can conjure up and invent, and what we think is truth, and what's reality. And uh, thankfully, reality was it was a raccoon and not a mountain lion, although it could have been, and... Uh, um, that, that's a lot about what we're going to talk about this morning. When we go through the Bible, sometimes we think in our head what the truth is, and maybe we determine truth based on our experience and not what the Word says, not what really is. And what is the truth? As Pilate asked the Lord, what is truth? Well, he should have stuck around and listened to the answer, because what's what the truth is, is whatever God says it is, and not what your brain says it is. Your brain will trick you into thinking things, and uh, other people will put things into your mind that aren't necessarily true. So we'll talk about that a little bit this morning, and it has a lot to do with Romans chapter 6. We talked, uh, we just got a kind of an introductory um, in, last week into this, and so let's read the first few verses here, and uh, we'll talk about it. 
Verse number 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's a good question. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, but he that is dead, for he that is dead, is freed from sin." Father, help us this morning with your word. Lord, didn't make it to be complex or really hard to understand. Um, You put it in this King James Bible for the whole world to have and understand and believe. So help us this morning to do that very thing. Uh, By your power and by the power of the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name, amen. Romans 6 is a very critical portion of Scripture. and Without it, we would have a significant hole in our Bible, and really of the gospel itself. It's, it would be, uh, without it, be a huge hole in our understanding of what Christ really did on the cross and the impact on our life. Romans 6 ought to be on the tip of every believer's tongue when asked, what happened to you? Uh, once you get saved and people realize there's something different, and they ask, what happened to you? Not only would you say, well, you know, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and my sins are forgiven, but you can also explain how that you were crucified with Him on the cross and you walk a new life now, a life apart from that old man. Romans 6 is an explanation of our co-crucifixion with Christ. It's the mechanics of the gospel. When the Bible says in Galatians 5.16 that we walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Romans 6 explains how and why you are able to do that. Romans 6 is often referred to as the sanctification chapter, part of the gospel, but often taught as a process in that the Christian can choose to believe by faith what God says to be true and walk in faith, live by faith uh, immediately, or like Abraham, learn over the course of about 25 years uh, before the promise is fulfilled. The choice is yours. Just like the choice of salvation was yours. God laid out the plan of salvation. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law in living and dying and uh, what He did on the cross for us. We can choose to believe that and be saved. Relinquish our responsibility in that. We can also choose to believe what God says about sanctification. You can receive it by faith immediately, or like Abraham, you can go on this long trek and try to do it yourself and reconcile uh, this this, uh, unbelievable promise that God gave us with your own experience and struggle your entire life, like it says and talks about in Romans 7. Christ's death, He died for us for... uh, Uh, Our atonement, our propitiation, our justification that all leads to peace with God, these destroyed the penalty of sin, didn't they? Us dying with Him was to destroy the power of sin and the flesh over us. 
You've often heard that it said uh, that God and Christ did deliver us not only from the penalty, but from the power of sin. You've all heard that, and maybe you even believe that. Romans 6 is the mechanics of how that happens. Paul lays this out here in, in Romans 6, and he goes into great detail about it. Um, he anticipates, like we said last week, the argument that people are going to have against this very thing. And, and really, the whole book of Romans, Paul anticipates the argument coming back from the Jews. And uh, he, he goes ahead and he deals with that. He anticipates the Jews saying, Paul, are you saying uh, you're doctrinally righteous but never expected to live righteous? Paul, are you saying that you uh, believe that you're called righteous but go on living in sin and the, there's really no expectation to live righteous? Paul, are you saying that your righteousness is really only a book righteousness? only and not practical righteousness that no one sees and you don't experience yourself? Or is that what you're saying, Paul? That's absurd, would be their conclusion. That's absurd. In fact, if that's what you believe, I'll just stick with the law because the law lays out a path for me to accomplish, accomplish, accomplish. And it demands a life of righteousness. What you're talking about, Paul, here, it... If, if what you're saying is true, and it doesn't demand a life of righteousness, I'll just stay with the law. Paul anticipates that argument. Rightfully so. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Now we'll start in Galatians chapter 2. <clears throat> Actually, let's go to chapter 3. They're really close, so it's not a lot of work to go from one to the other. Galatians 3, verse number 11. It says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Oops. Let's start with verse number 2. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, that's a good question. Did you receive uh, salvation by the works of the law? No. Um, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? No. That's a, that's a softball question. In verse number 3 he says, Are ye so foolish knowing that, yeah, no, we didn't receive the Spirit by works, but by faith, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Paul's talking about this walk of righteousness. Now, in, in the book of Galatians, the, the issue of circumcision came up, but circumcision was just a representation of really any work that you would do to please God or to fulfill some commandment that puts you in a position where God would be pleased with you. When it comes to sanctification, is that our attitude, that we have to do certain things to be sanctified, to be completely delivered from sin? There is an expectation that we would walk and live by faith. Like it says in verse number 11 there, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. That live is present tense. Everything that we do when it comes to the Lord and His promises are based on faith, not some work. That's the point Paul is trying to make here in a strong way in Galatians. It's still faith. It's still faith and always will be. Now go back to uh, Galatians chapter 2. Verse number 16. Knowing that a man 
is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's, that's a, a good point. Nobody is justified. We're saved by grace through faith. Verse 17, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Really, verse 17 is the same thing as Romans 6, 1. Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. That's what he's saying there. If we seek to be justified by Christ, and we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ the minister of sin? That doesn't reconcile. That doesn't make any sense. Verse 18, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. What was destroyed? Everything through the body of Christ in our co-crucifixion with Christ. All those things, all those things that God has not only forgiven us for and forgotten, but our co-crucifixion in Christ delivers us from the power of this sin that's in the flesh. We're delivered from that. And that was destroyed on the cross. He said, shall we now go forward and build again those things which I destroyed and make myself a transgressor? In other words, it's nobody's excuse but mine. Verse 19, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. You see, the context of this narrative here in Galatians is that it's not about uh, uh, our future life in eternity. It's about today. It's about our life in Christ. It's about our walk in Christ as a Christian, as a believer. And, and, and it says that through the law, I'm dead to the law. Well, that's, that's a good way for us to understand what it means to be dead to sin. Dead to the law or dead to sin. There's a common denominator and there's something died in both of those verses. And it's not sin that died, and it's not the law that died. Something else died. What is that thing that died? I died. Right? So, so therefore, we're not servant to the law. A dead man does not answer to the law. And a dead man does not answer to sin either. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. There's a connection there with my death and my ability to live in righteousness. That I might live unto God. So this idea that you would live unto God in the old man, forget it. Many of you probably have tried. And it's frustrating Verse 20, for I am crucified with Christ. Really, he's talking about living unto God. He's talking about not being a transgressor. He's talking about not proceeding in sin, God forbid. And he says, for I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, not talking about the future, not talking about some 25-year process of conforming and becoming something, uh, you know, imaginary. He says, the life that I now live. I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. See, faith is always a part of that equation who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Not should be, or will be, or could be, or I try to make myself crucified with him. He says, I am crucified with him. Verse 
You see, folks, there's a connection between the death of Christ and the life of righteousness that you can live by faith. You cannot separate those two. The key to walking with God, the key to walking in righteousness and the life that you live, the key to that is the death of the old man. It's not a process. It's something that God says has happened, has happened. It's not anything that you do to make happen. It has happened. You were baptized into Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. You know, we all believe and know that the Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith. We all know that. You know you're sanctified the same way? <clears throat> the boys and I were up in the mountains one time, and we were going to go look for an elk or a deer or something, and we were on horseback. And uh, it was in eastern Idaho up by Dubois. And you get up on those foothills in the, in the late fall, it can get hot. And we're going along, and we come across this big old round water trough, you know, that somebody had used to water the cattle. And, and so uh, we, we stopped, and we were going to get a drink. And uh, so we stopped, and, and I got out, and, or got off, and the boys were there, and, and I, I got to thinking, there was this pipe that came out of the ground, and it came up, and it kind of just sat on the edge of this big round tank, and a little water was coming out of that thing, just, to, just enough to keep it full, if the cattle were to drink out of it, you know, and so the horses, I got, I got down there, and I kind of pushed away all the floaties, and uh, got myself a drink, and then the horse was right next to me. He got a drink, and then he turned his head, and all this goo landed on the back of my head. And That's not part of the story, but it is part of the story. <laughs> but I got to thinking about that pipe and that water. And I got to thinking about that verse, that we're saved by grace through faith. The water was the grace. The pipe was the faith. That pipe went way up into this, I don't know how long it was, um, hundreds of yards up into this um, ravine that uh, came out of the mountains. And some rancher years and years ago had buried that pipe and, and hooked it up to that stream and it dribbled into this tank to water his stock. And uh, it, salvation is like that. The water is what saves the pipe doesn't save, it's the water. But you access the water through that pipe. That pipe delivers it, and that pipe is our faith. And we can access the grace of God unto salvation the same way. Just faith. But it's still God's grace that saves. The same way with sanctification. The same way. It's still the grace of God, but it takes a pipe. And that pipe is your faith, your belief, not your work. You don't have to dig a trench. You don't have to go find some stream. It's there for you to access just by faith. So when Paul talks about this in Galatians, about living by faith, about God and Christ living in me, and that, that we would walk now with God, that I might live unto God, that we should not serve sin. Does that sound like someone who is, who is saved yet struggling with sin every day? Does Paul describe himself that way in any of the books? Does it describe one who, is, who concedes that there is uh, no real deliverance from sin? Does it sound like someone that would say that once you're saved, you will never really be delivered from sin or its power until you physically die? Quite the opposite is what Paul describes here. If you were to read all those things that we read, whether it's Romans or Galatians or Colossians, and come away with, yep, the Christian life is a struggle from the day that you get saved until you die, you have to dig pretty hard to find that. I find quite the opposite, that Paul concedes that there, not only can you, should you not sin, but how can you? Knowing that you're crucified with Him, and that that old man is dead. 
You say, but Brother Dave, that's not my experience. Is that what we're talking about this morning? Your experience? Is your experience now the thing that dictates what's true, like my, my mountain lion with a raccoon's head? Right? Is it now we, we're going to resort to what we think and feel and have experienced in our own life to determine what's truth? Or do we revert to the Bible and what it says? No matter how hard it is to understand or to believe or trust, were you saved by anything but faith? No. Will you walk with God by anything other than faith? No. Paul's not talking about his experience here. He never mentions really his experience. He just mentions what's true. He's talking about what God has done. And what it means to be in Christ. That is our experience. We died with Him and are made free from the law, from sin, from self. You see, it's not about you. It's about Him. Now, you'll need to reconcile, and He helps us through the Scripture, reconcile our life and our daily walk. He does that. And the struggles that we have. But he doesn't make excuse for sin. He gives us quite the opposite. Here's an example. Like before you were saved, you felt probably the load of guilt. You felt uh, the judgment of God that awaits you. You struggled with any assurance that you pleased God. And no matter how religious you were, you, you felt that there was something missing. Several examples of that through the New Testament. Lord, I've, I've done all the commandments. What lack I yet? That guy knew he lacked something. Something was missing. And maybe you felt the same thing in your life. You didn't have that assurance that no matter how you tried to please God, you didn't have that assurance that heaven awaited for you. There was a struggle. Religion taught you to be good and do right. And then maybe, maybe um, you could go to heaven but yet something was missing, no matter how hard you tried. You know, Martin Luther was like that. You read his story? He was a guy that was like a monk and, and living just as perfect as he could, but he agonized over the fact that something was missing. Something didn't line up, and it had to do with his daily life until he finally came to that realization that, oh, a man lives by faith, too. Huh. But religion teaches us quite the opposite. And until you relinquished to the belief that Christ had done all that was required, your sins were forgiven, the weight was gone, there was assurance, you felt a new chance at life when you got saved. Does that describe what happened to you? I think that describes a lot of people's experience, you know, you had this weight, and you knew you couldn't, and uh, you relinquished your, your belief to what Jesus Christ did on the cross was sufficient, completely sufficient, and I'm going to trust and put all my faith and trust in what He did for me. But there was a struggle before that, wasn't there? You know, you still struggle. Now you struggle with the freedom from sin for the very same reason. You struggle with living a life free from sin for the same reason you struggled before, that there's something that you need to do. There is, but it's not what you think. There is something you need to do, but it's not what you think. Has anybody ever heard that, well, you need to, you need to die to yourself? You ever heard that? You, the Bible says you need to die daily. You ever heard that? I've heard that a lot from Baptists. All the things I've heard are from Baptists. I don't talk to Catholics or Presbyterians. I just talk to my friends. <laughs> they all say these things. You need to die daily. 
You need to crucify the flesh. You need to, uh, there's a lot of things you need to do. Does anything ring a bell when I say all those things you need to do? Wait a minute. I'm back to doing? See, that's what Paul was talking about when he said, you began in the Spirit, now are you made perfect in the flesh? That doesn't make sense. Because before I got saved and it was up to me, I had a problem. Me wasn't very good. And when it comes to sanctification and deliverance from sin, I'm really not very good at that either. When somebody says you need to die daily or you need to crucify the flesh, I, I begin to scratch my head thinking, how would you do that? How would you do that? Somebody practically tell me how it is you crucify the flesh or you die daily. Well, it's a mental thing. Yeah, you nailed it. You know, back in the mid-1850s, there was a movement over in England. It was called the Keswick Movement. Anybody ever hear of that? A couple of you. That Keswick movement permeates modern Christianity today in a big, big way. It's also called the, sometimes the higher life or the deeper life, the deeper Christian life. You ever heard that? Yeah. So the main idea in, in, in the Keswick was a, a town in England where these people got together and they started talking philosophy and and these are all good religious people. But the main idea in the Keswick theology or of the higher life movement, also known as a deeper Christian life, is that the Christian should move on from his initial conversion experience to also experience a second work of God in his life. This work of God is called entire sanctification or the second blessing, the second touch, or being filled with the Holy Spirit and various other terms. Believers are encouraged to let go and let God. In order to receive this, higher life teachers promote the idea that the Christians who receive this blessing from God can live a more holy life that is less sinful or even sinless. The Keswick approach seeks to provide a uh, a mediating and biblically balanced solution to the problem of subnormal Christian experience. The official teaching has been that every believer in this life is left with a natural proclivity to sin and will do so without the countervailing influence of the Holy Spirit. I think the movement itself is sincere. And there was a lot of great men of God, I could name their names and you'd know them, that believed in that and followed after that. They so wanted a walk with Christ that they struggled to explain or come to the solution as it's laid out in Romans 6 that they, they got together and they talked about this and, and they all desired this deeper life. There's more, there's got to be more to the Christian life than just I'm saved and now I just wait for heaven to come. What about this life? And how do I quit sinning? And how do am I delivered from this body of death like Paul talks about in Romans 7? How has that happened? And they came to this conclusion that, well, there must be this second work of the Holy Ghost and, and uh, there's this second blessing and, and there's something else that has to happen in my Christian life that delivers me from this. And, and so they came up with this theology. A lot of books written about this. Books like The Normal Christian Life by Roy Hessian, Andrew Murray's Absolute Surrender, um, Born Crucified, uh, books by Watchman Nee, and uh, all deeper life books that have sold millions. Maybe some of you read these, The Deeper Christian Life the normal Christian life. Great men of God. Great men of God. And if you read those, you come really close to Romans 6, but you never quite get there. 
They take the teachings of Romans 6 and turn it into a work of grace. A work that involves deep surrender and deep faith and deeper commitment and yet so deep that you've got to come up for error, otherwise you'll suffocate. It involves humility and surrender and brokenness. To, to get yourself into a position or a place that you're prepared to receive this second blessing of some sort. Sounds very frustrating to me. It also sounds like God wouldn't get much of the glory if you went through all this. As I read about that Keswick theology, um, there, were some, there were some questions and some comments at the bottom that I thought was interesting, and it kind of helps explain what the whole idea is. One person wrote, after uh, there was a question, is the crucified life the same as salvation? And somebody wrote, no, the crucified life is a life after salvation. It demonstrates total commitment and yielding to the saving grace of Christ. That all sounds good. Most Christians have come into salvation, but they have not crucified the flesh. This might sound strange in the context of salvation, but the only way to experience the full resurrected life of Christ is by crucifying the flesh. It means bringing everything in your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Anybody in here done that yet? Brought everything into the Lordship of Christ? Well, you're not sanctified. There should not be gaps in our relationship with Christ. We are either with Christ or we are not with Him. Somebody else wrote, No, it's submitting your will to the will of God. For example, God's, God says, Love your enemy and pray for him. Uh, trust God to make things right. But your will says, I want to do him as he did me. The choice to do God's will causes a person to become an overcomer from their will, freeing them to live in the power of God. Each decision you make to do the will of God brings more freedom, but you must be consistent to do God's will, which is His Word, to become a son of God, completely submitted and committed to Holy Ghost leading through the Word of God. Wow. Wow. That sounds kind of hard. Does it sound hard? Or is it just me? You know what it sounds like? It sounds like works. Let me ask you, is this what Abraham did? Let's take a look at what Abraham believed. It, it says that in early in, in Romans, it says that Abraham, chapter 4, believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham did struggle after that, didn't he? He struggled with that promise. He never struggled with if the promise was going to be made. What did he struggle with? How it was going to be made. That's what he struggled with. That's what we struggle with. After salvation, we don't struggle that God wants, us to deliver, wants to deliver us from sin. We just don't understand how. And, and how many books can you read that talk about deliverance from sin? All these deeper life books, you know, and this is what you need to do. You need to surrender. You need to get broken. You need to be emptied of self. And you need to crucify the flesh. And all that is works. If that's what you're going to bring to God, what do you think God's response to that is going to be? If you had a box that was full of works and you went to God and said, Lord, here's all my good works, will you accept me? We know the answer to that, don't we? Get rid of your works. Okay, so you get rid of your works and you come to God with an empty box and say, Lord, I've emptied myself of all my works and, and now I'm, it's, I'm full of humility and brokenness and my box is empty. Now what do you think of my box? That's, folks, that's fruit off the same tree. And he's not interested in what's in your box. He's not interested in that at all. He's interested in what his son did for you, both to free you from the penalty of sin, but also the power. It's all Jesus Christ and what he did. 
It's not your brokenness and not your emptiness that he's impressed with. What's, what's the end of that road look like? <clears throat> we can't separate sanctification from the gospel and say it's, it's a lifelong process of, uh, of improvement, that it's a separate work of God, a second blessing of some sort. Or we cannot believe and, and take on the responsibility that it's now up to us that that we're saved, uh, we are once saved by faith, but now it's do, do, do to overcome sin in the flesh. We also shouldn't spiritualize the promise. When it says, I'm dead or I'm crucified, he's not talking spiritually. When, when God looked at Abraham and said, Abraham, you're going to be the, or you are the father of a great nation. Did Abraham look at God and say, yeah, but... That's spiritually speaking, right? But that's what we do. Because we don't understand it, and it's hard to believe, we tend to spiritualize things. But that is not what Abraham did. He just, what did he do? He believed God. As hard as that was to believe, an old man being a father of a great nation. He just believed God for what he said. Romans 7 is an example of that. When it concludes at the end, it says, Who shall deliver me from this body of this death? The answer, Jesus Christ. Not me. You know, I think about Abraham's story and uh, the limited success that he had taking on the responsibility to, to uh, produce seed. And uh, we, we kind of laugh at that. Abraham, what in the world were you thinking? Uh, yeah, let's, it, it's, it's me and the, the, the help. You know, between us, we'll, we'll create a, a child and, and we'll go from there. And there are all these different ideas on how this was, God's promise was going to take place. And, and every time he took on himself the responsibility to fulfill the promise, it, it led to failure. Um. You know, when, when people talk about getting saved and then getting delivered from sin, I've heard a lot of people say, again, Baptists. Yep, as soon as I got saved, God took away my, my cusser, and uh, I don't smoke, and I don't drink, and I don't chew, and I don't run around with those that do. You ever hear that before? Right? That's almost like gospel. That's not so hard. My dad did that as a lost man. When he remarried, he remarried a, a, a fine lady that just believed God and wanted to live right and do right. And she said to him, you know, if we're going to be married, you've got to cu stop cussing and stop drinking and, and quit smoking. And prior to that, we were raised in the bowling alley, and that's all we did was smoke and cuss and drink, and that was at a young age. That's what we grew up in. You know what my dad said? Okay. And he did. He quit all those things. He'd cuss a little bit every once in a while. But for the most part, he quit all that stuff. He quit smoking, drinking, and cussing. And he was not saved. You can do that as a lost person. That's no accomplishment. Right? Some people have super strong self-control. I know a lot of people like that, that if you were to compare me and them, hands down, they're definitely the better. <clears throat> so Abraham struggled. After God had given him the promise, um, he struggled for 25 years before the promise became true, and he finally relinquished to what God's plan was from the beginning. That, no, Abraham, you are going to be the father, and it is going to be through Sarah, and it's going to be by faith. You know, back to my dad, after he quit all those things, it made him a better person. But I could still tell that in my dad, there was still a lot of anger. There was still a lot of confusion about what a right relationship with 
a spouse was supposed to be, what a right relationship with a child is supposed to be, and he didn't, definitely didn't have a good relationship with God. He, there were still so many things left unchecked. My dad claims to be saved today, um, and who am I to argue? I hope so. Let's go back to Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Folks, I don't know how more simple God could lay that out to a believer. It is, it is so simple. So what does it come down to? Like it did with Abraham, it came down to relinquishing, I've got this, Lord, I've got it figured out, and this is the way I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to crucify the flesh. This is how I'm going to die to myself daily. This is how I'm going to live the crucified life too. Lord, I don't know how, but it says that I'm crucified with you. And the only thing that died when Christ died was that old body. And our old body is dead with him, that we might live in newness of life apart from that body. Now, as we go through the rest of Romans 6, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the mechanics of that. We'll talk about the ramifications of that and how, how a person can walk free from sin. You say, Brother Dave, are you talking about living holy? I'm glad you're awake. Do you think that God would put His Son through all that He did to give us some broken solution that only works partially? That, that really doesn't create a new creature, that creates a, a creature that is, is uh, well, partially fixed, but not really completely until the day that they die and they go off into glory. Is that what you think? God believes that he put his son through all that? I hope not. There's a real deliverance in the gospel message. It's real. And what it requires is your faith. It requires your belief. I know people that believe this and walk in faith, delivered from sin. Do you know anybody? I've experienced it. But because I've experienced it, doesn't make it true. What makes it true is because God said so. That's what makes it true. You know the thing that kept Abraham going? Um, we were talking this morning, uh, Brother Dave and I were talking about when the Lord came back and walked over the water in that storm, and those, those sailors were, they were, a fear for their life, you know, in that terrible storm. What did he find them doing? They were rowing the dickens out of that boat, right? To get it going in the right direction, hit the waves just right. They had a want to, to survive, didn't they? They didn't just throw the oars away and say, well, forget it, there's no chance. They had a desire to live. And you could see that in their expression, in their activity, that they were giving it all they had to try to live through the night, through that storm. Why don't people believe this and walk in faith and walk with God and live a life apart from sin? Maybe they don't want to bad enough. If you want to bad enough, the answer is there. If you, when you got saved, did you want to get saved bad enough? That you would walk down an aisle in front of all those people and kneel down and weep 
you wanted to bad enough if that's what you did. Or wherever you got saved, you relinquished that it wasn't you and you gave it to God and you trusted. You wanted it bad enough to do that. Do you want a holy life bad enough to believe Romans chapter 6? If you do, that's the solution, is just believing what God has done and what He said is true in our life. Last week, I used the illustration of the man being let down through the roof, the palsied man. And the Lord looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. And that was the kind of head scratcher. He didn't come for that, but yet he did. It's not so hard to say your sins are forgiven. Who would know that? But to say rise and walk, now that's another story. He said, so that you know that the Son of Man has power on this earth to forgive, rise up and walk. And that young man got up. To say that you're a Christian and forgiven is easy. To walk it. Now that's where the rubber meets the road. You can do that because of what Romans 6 tells us. You're crucified with Christ. Well, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about what died and what didn't die and what that means there going forward. Um, but you've got to want to. That's what it starts with. You've got to want to. Those guys that left that palsy guy through the roof, they wanted to. They had a drive. They don't care about the people. They don't care about the roof. They don't care what they look like. A bunch of morons up there lowering that guy through the roof. We've all done stuff like that. Why? Because we wanted to. You want to be delivered from sin? There's a way. And God made it so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples that you've given. You didn't just say it. Lord, you said, no, here's some examples. Here's some examples. Gideon and Daniel and David and Abraham and Moses and Paul and all those, all those, so many more. Lord, that walked. Help us to understand, Lord. Give us, give us that desire to want to and be delivered and walk in that newness of life. Lord, thank you for this, uh, this time, this church, and these good folks. And uh, we pray that the next hour would be a blessing to you as we lift up our voice in praise and thanksgiving and our ears move forward to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen.